Hello, and welcome to this introduction to the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The occasion for this presentation is to provide some background for persons who are interested in seeing the exhibit of the Dead Sea Scrolls that opened at the Cincinnati Museum Center on November 16th. I will be covering in summary fashion the story of the discovery of the site and the caves, the archaeology of the site, and an overview of the literature that resulted from these discoveries. I also will make comments about the relationship between the different sources of information that are encompassed within the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Pliny the Elder wrote the following in his natural history around or shortly after 70 CE. In this field of study, we use the term CE rather than AD to designate the common era, the time in human history after which both Christianity and Judaism are in existence. The dates are the same regardless of the abbreviation employed, I will also use BCE in this presentation to designate before the Common Era. Reading Pliny. To the west of the Dead Sea, the Essenes have put the necessary distance between themselves and the insalubrious shore. They are a people unique of its kind and admirable beyond all others in the whole world, without women and renouncing love entirely, without money, and having for company only the palm trees. Owing to the throng of newcomers, this people is daily reborn in equal number, indeed those whom, wearied by the fluctuation of fortunes, life leads to adopt their customs, stream in in great numbers. Thus, unbelievable though this may seem, for thousands of centuries a race has existed which is eternal, yet into which no one is born. So fruitful for them is the repentance which others feel for their past lives. So far Pliny. While elements in this description are idealized and unrealistic, it is this reference which permitted those first scholars encountering the materials in the scrolls to make a concrete identification with a specific geographical area. Such an identification was possible because Josephus had provided his readers with a lengthy description of the Essenes. Josephus is the Jewish historian who wrote at the end of the first century. Philo, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria, also gives us a briefer description of the Essenes as do some of the non-Jewish Greek and Latin authors from those first few centuries. Josephus says that the Essenes have a reputation for cultivating a particularly saintly life. They renounce pleasure as an evil and regard temperance and control of the passions as a special virtue. They disdain marriage for themselves, but adopt the children of others at a tender age in order to instruct them. <clears throat> they regard them as belonging to them by kinship and condition them to conform to their customs. It is not that they abolish marriage or the propagation of the species resulting from it, but they are on their guard against the licentiousness of women and are convinced that none of them is faithful to one man. End of Josephus. The gender wars seem to have a long history. He also claims that they were against slavery, they held property in common, giving to each man according to his need, as also attributed to the earlier followers of Jesus in Acts 4.32. A common meal and a daily cycle of work, prayer, and eating was characteristic of these Essenes. While an identification of the Essenes and the scrolls was made very early in the process of discovery, we note that the name Essene never appears in the Qumran texts, and that there are no prohibitions of family life to be found there, but rather divorce and marriage law, advice for family life, and laws regarding incest. Significantly, Josephus also speaks of them living in towns, rather than along the shore of the Dead Sea, or in any remote desert location. 
The story of the discovery. In late 1946 or early 1947, three Tamir herdsmen tumbled, stumbled upon a cave containing some jars and three skulls. Mohammed Adid the wolf is on the right, and he's said to have been the first one to enter the cave. They found three scrolls and showed them to a few people in Bethlehem, among them a Bethlehem antiquities dealer, Shahil Iskandar Shaheen, better known later as Kondo, and George Ishaya, or Isaiah, both members of the Syrian Orthodox Church. The Bedouin were encouraged to go back to the cave and see if they could find more scrolls. They found seven scrolls in total. After a series of missteps, three of these scrolls were sold to Mar Athanasius Yeshua Samuel, head of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem, for approximately $100. You pass the Syrian Orthodox Monastery on your way to the Western Wall from the Damascus Gate entry into the Old City. The three scrolls were the Manual of Discipline, now known as the Community Rule, the Large Isaiah Scroll, and a commentary commonly called Pesher Habakkuk. Later, he acquired a fourth scroll, the Genesis Apocryphon, in Aramaic. In the meantime, Dr. Elazar Lipa Sukenik became aware of the other three scrolls through a different antiquities dealer from Bethlehem named Fidi Salahi. Sukenik was the founder of the Department of Archaeology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was informed of these other scrolls, so he traveled in disguise across the military lines to Bethlehem on November 29, 1947, to view these other scrolls. November 29 is the day the UN voted for the partition of the area, thereby beginning the process for creating the State of Israel. In the next few months, Sukenek purchased for the State of Israel the other three scrolls, the Thanksgiving Hymn Scroll, the War Scroll, and a second Isaiah Scroll. In the meantime, Mar Athanasius had given permission to John Trevor, then acting director of the American Schools of Oriental Research in Jerusalem, to photograph his three scrolls, telling him initially that they were part of the monastery library collection. Recognized that this was going on in the midst of the war, so travel across military lines, even across streets, was difficult as was communication and living provisions. Mar Athanasius then moved to the United States, bringing the scrolls with him. After displaying them at both the Library of Congress and at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago, he placed this famous ad in the Wall Street Journal. This was brought to the attention of Yigal Yadin on the right, the son of Sukenik and also an archaeologist. Acting through an intermediary, later identified as Professor Harry Olinsky of the Hebrew Union College in New York, Yadin bought the scrolls for $250,000 for the State of Israel. The shrine of the book, with its well-known image, was built to house these scrolls, dedicated on April 20, 1965. The cave in which the Bedouin said these scrolls were found was eventually designated as Cave 1 by the archaeologists. It was near the top of the hills leading out into the desert above and about a half mile north of the site of Qumran. Qumran itself is found at the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. In the partition of the land, creating the State of Israel in 1947, that area was designated as part of the territory of Jordan. Hence, archaeological work was under the jurisdiction of the Department of Antiquities of Jordan. As knowledge of the discovery of the scrolls became more widespread, it came to the attention of the Department of Antiquities and the archaeologists. 
Father Roland de Vaux on the left, a Dominican priest and archaeologist and director of the Ecole Biblique in East Jerusalem, and Lancaster Harding on the right, curator and later director of the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, were authorized to excavate Cave 1 and carried out the work in 1949. They found additional fragments of scrolls, scroll jars, and other pottery. After initial reluctance to excavate the site of Qumran because they did not see any evidence of connection to the scrolls that they had found, they did gradually changed their mind and began work on it in 1951. What they found was evidence of habitation from the pre-exilic period until after the Roman destruction of the temple. From the first phase, they found pottery from the earlier Israelite period and a jar handle with the inscription Lamelech to or for the king, dating it to this period prior to the destruction of the Solomonic Temple. The most significant archaeological evidence from this period was a large round cistern located in the center of the western portion of the site. When we summarize DeVoe's understanding of the development of the site, we see a salt malt settlement occupying the space of the original Israelite settlement earlier, early in the Hasmonean period. That's period 1a. The Hasmoneans are the successors of Judah Maccabee, who reclaimed the Jerusalem temple from the Greek occupation under Antiochus IV, an event related in the popular story of Hanukkah. The first mention of the Jewish sects, such as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes by Josephus is shortly after Jonathan, the brother of Judah Maccabee, becomes high priest. Then there is a large occupation of this site by the group most commonly identified by, as the Essenes. This is period 1b, and they expanded the structures and laid the basic formation of the site as we recognize it when we visit there today. This occurred later in the first century BCE during the time of John Hyrcanus, whom we know had conflicts with the Pharisees, one of the other groups designated as sects by Josephus. Coins dated to the time of Alexander Janius, who ruled from 103 to 76 BCE and was the son of John Hyrcanus, are the most common at the site, reflecting a time of major habitation. There is evidence of an earthquake that is dated to 31 BCE and destruction by fire. For Devol, this resulted in a time of abandonment with subsequent resettlement after the death of Herod, period 2, lasting until the Roman subjugation of the area at the time of the destruction of the temple. It was then briefly a camp for Roman soldiers. As in antiquity, we enter the site from the northwest corner next to the tower, which is its most prominent architectural features. From the aerial view, we can identify its location as well as the older Israelite cistern. Our viewpoint on the slide is above and behind the northeast corner. When we stand on the platform above the construction, we see one of the storerooms in the tower. This is a common feature for settlements in antiquity to have food stored in protected areas. There is no first floor entrance to these storerooms. One of the debates about the tower is whether it was a fortress rather than only a storage area, leading some to think that this may have been a manor house for a country estate with a required security, or even an outpost for the advancement or protection of the area secured by the Hasmonean kings. Immediately south of the tower, we see a section that is usually regarded as a study or worship area, or both. 
In the middle, we see a room that has an opening on the left side that would permit items to be passed back and forth between it and another room to the south. This southern room, now seen as two with a dividing wall from phase two in the Vaux, would originally have been one large room. Whether this opening was for the passing of scrolls, food or drink, or anything else, we don't know. On the northern side of this room is a niche whose purpose we also do not know. Whether it contained water related to purity rites or some entirely different function, all is possible. In this picture, you see my wife Carol assisting me as I photograph the site. Significant is the bench that surrounds the middle room that could have served a purpose for either prayer, study, or communal assembly. In the room next to the tower, we see the remains of a stairway. This stairway would have led up to a second floor. In this digital reconstruction, designed at UCLA by Robert Carville, we see the entrance gate, the Northwest Tower, and the two-story section that we have just been describing. To the left of this tower is a large rectangular room dubbed the Scriptorium by De Vaux. This is the room in which he believed the scrolls were copied. He based this upon the fact that a long bench was found in this room in the collapsed debris from the second floor at which he thought scribes sat and wrote to dictation. This is not a practice attested elsewhere in the area at the time. Inkwells were also found at this location. During phase one, the initial expansion, this room had a large bay window at the northern end. This was filled in during the second phase of settlement. Returning to an overview of the site, we know kitchen and storage areas in the northeast corner, pottery production facilities in the southeast corner, pottery production and assembly areas in the western section, and some stables along the southwest corner. Along the southern side is a large common room that apparently was used for dining and perhaps assemblies of some sort. We know this because in the southwest corner of this room, we found an interesting annex. At the time of reoccupation, the remaining settlers cleaned up this room by pushing pottery into the southern end. Remnants of about 1,000 pieces of tableware and then building a wall right across here, across the center of the room, to block it off. By looking at a diagram of the site, we can get reoriented. Here we see the tower, the dining room, and the annex. What we now want to pay attention to is the water system a very important aspect of a settlement in an arid environment. Water comes into the settlement from an aqueduct in the northwest corner. In the first settlement, it came through sedimentation pools that let the sand settle, and then into an aqueduct that runs through the settlement, past the Israelite period cistern, and other cisterns in that area through and then it wind, and then past the cisterns in the southern edge 
sorry, the cursor isn't quite moving right here. Um, to repeat, the aqueduct comes from the Israelite cistern and then uh, into the settlement through the site past these large cisterns here and then winds up in two large cisterns in the southeast and the southwest corner of the settlement. Also evident is the line designating where the earthquake damage cut through the site. Here we see the large cistern that is immediately north of the dining hall and the aqueduct running alongside it. There's the aqueduct. We note the wall in this cistern indicating that it was divided in half at some point and we see some ridges in the bottom right hand corner. These would appear to have served the purpose of separating the impure who are going down into the mikvah, the ritual bath, from those coming out already made pure so that they did not touch one another. This is a potential problem in larger communal mikvah oath designed to accommodate larger numbers of people. On the eastern side, we see one of the mikvah oath that was abandoned after the earthquake and destruction. The earthquake damage here is apparent, as are the ridges for purity designation purposes. The cistern in the southeast corner was filled with silt or sand. Yitzhar Hirschfeld, an archaeologist at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, excavated this and thought this was an intentional structure built to collect the sand to use for pottery production. We do not know of another instance where this method was employed to collect the sand used for making pottery. Here we see the deep large cistern in the southwest corner. Pottery kilns in the southeast corner of the site. The aqueduct around the Israelite period cistern and a large stepped pool in the northwest corner associated with the sedimentation areas. Here we see the aqueduct running into the site from the northwest corner. Now, if we turn around, we see that the water comes to the site from this aqueduct in the hills beyond. It winds around the hill, goes through a tunnel through the hill, and comes out on the other side. The tunnel is large enough to comfortably call, crawl through. The water comes from the plain above into the wadi, or ravine, is collected in a pool that appears to have had a small dam in antiquity and then descends into the channel that feeds the aqueduct through the mountain. Returning to the site, we see its eastern wall. Beyond this wall, to the east of the site, is a cemetery with three fingers or extensions that contain between 1,100 and 1,200 graves. They have a north-south orientation. The majority of those excavated were male. With that brief overview, I no want to note that there are various divergent interpretations of this data. However, we must note that all of DeVoe's field notes and all of the material from the site have never been fully published. So archaeologists today are limited in how they assess his conclusions. The archaeologist who has advanced the most well-known critique while accepting much of DeVoe's viewpoint is Jody Magnus from the University of North Carolina. She disagrees on chronology while accepting the basic premise that the site is related to the Essenes and through the provisions of a sectarian lifestyle outlined in some of the scrolls. However, she does not see a gradual growth of the site, but rather one major expansion at the time of a sectarian occupation 
by an Essene group around 1000 BCE. This major expansion is dated about 30 to 50 years later than Devaux. This group did not leave the site after the earthquake, but the evidence of the fire suggests a brief period of abandonment and subsequent rebuilding. It also appears to have been used by Roman soldiers during the Second Jewish Revolt, the Bar Kokhba War of 132 to 135 CE. In the last two decades, other viewpoints concerning the site have been advanced by archaeologists, a fortress or military outpost for the Hasmoneans, a rural manor house and agricultural property with defensive capabilities, an industrial pottery and or perfume production center, and a religious retreat center not necessarily sectarian. Some have also argued that the scrolls were not connected to the site, but rather were stored there at the time of the war with Rome. By 1956, 11 caves had been explored with written materials from almost all of them. You can see that they are distributed over approximately a one and one half mile area in relationship to the site itself. The two northern caves are the other sources of actual scrolls. The copper scroll was found in cave three, now collapsed, and three other scrolls from cave 11, the temple scroll, the psalm scroll, and the Job Targum in Aramaic. It was the largest of the caves to be found. There are two types of caves. Those in the hills behind the site, caves 1 to 3 and 11, are natural caves found in the hills. The stone of the area is dolomite, slightly softer than granite. The other caves, caves 4 to 10, are immediately behind the site. In the sides of the terrace, below the plateau on which Qumran is located. These caves are hollowed out of a soft stone referred to as marl. This is so soft that it becomes powder when you pick up a handful of it. The most significant is Cave 4. As you saw, it is a short walking distance from the settlement and could have been used on a daily basis by persons at the site. It is now cave, two caves but could have been one in antiquity. The access from the plateau at the top is a modern entrance created by archaeologists for their work. It would have been accessed from the side of the wadi in antiquity. Here is the descent into the cave from the modern entrance. You would not per be permitted to do this if you visited the site today. Bedouin started showing up at the entrance to the Akol Biblique in Jerusalem with a larger number of fragments, and Kondo also had a larger number of fragments available. DeVoe and Harding, out of money provided by the Jordanian government, about $15,000, began to purchase these fragments, but then ran out of money. Securing more funds from various sources, they continued to buy fragments but finally found out where they were coming from. This large cache of scrolls was coming from Cave 4. They excavated it in 1952, finding even more fragments. Estimates vary, often the number 80,000 to 100,000 fragments in total uh, are mentioned. This is the collection that stands at the heart of a good deal of Dead Sea Scrolls research today. These fragments were housed at the Palestinian Archaeological Museum in East Jerusalem. Recognize that East Jerusalem also was within the territory of Jordan after 1947, hence the fragments also were under the jurisdiction of the Department of Antiquities. Under the leadership of Roland DeVoe, an international team of Christian scholars was assembled to sort, catalog, and begin to cipher this massive amount of material. 
Frank Moore Cross, J.T. Millick from France, and John Strugnell, then of England, later moving to the United States, were some of the names that became well known for their work on this material. The scrollery in the museum viewed here, the museum later renamed the Rockefeller Museum after 1967, was the place where they worked. They sorted the fragments, identifying them by composition and scribal hand, in an amazing piece of detective work. Then these same scholars began to publish these works in a series entitled The Discoveries in the Judean Desert by Oxford University Press. How on, however, only seven volumes had appeared by 1982, and there were scholars around the world waiting to examine this material. This series now includes 40 volumes. What had happened? Later in the 1950s, some younger scholars, such as Joseph Fitzmaier and Raymond Brown, were brought to Jerusalem to go through each fragment and make an index card for each word, a concordance. John Strugnell gave Bensi and Wacholder on the left, my doctoral advisor at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, a copy of this concordance in the late 1980s. Both Strugnell and Wacholder are now deceased. Martin Abeg on the right, a doctoral student of Wacholder's at the time, and now at Trinity Western University in Vancouver, British Columbia, began to plug this computer into a concordance for his own research, and they jointly decided to publish the results, essentially reconstructing the fragments from the concordance. The first four volumes appeared in 1991. This story is told in greater detail in the museum exhibit. At the same time, the Huntington Library in California announced Unlimited Scholar the access to their collection of photographs of the scroll. The Israel Antiquities Authority then announced open access to the museum holdings for all qualified scholars, while at the same time expanding the official publication team to over 50 scholars. The remainder of the volumes were published between 1994 and 2010. From 1991 on, all trained scholars could begin to confront the full depth and breadth of the material known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The study of the Dead Sea Scrolls was substantially transformed for many scholars with the influx of this new material. Let's review where we are. We have identified three different types of evidence that bear directly upon the study of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Each of these bodies of evidence provide conflicting information bearing on the issues involved, sometimes even internally contradictory. For example, we certainly do not at the moment have consensus on the interpretation of the archaeological data. We now are more aware that the, that the accounts of the scenes from writers such as Josephus and Philo differ in significant ways from the material in the scrolls. DeVoe, for the most part, argued for what became known as the Essene Hypothesis, in which he assumed that all three of these bodies of information related to one historical group in the same period of time. So you could use the literature to fill the gaps in the archaeological record and vice versa. Questions about such an approach began to surface with greater intensity in the late 1980s, and since that time, the Essene hypothesis has come under even greater scrutiny. When we talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, we are actually referring to a much broader collection of material than that which comes from the 11 caves situated close to the site of Qumran. During the 1950s and 1960s, in both the Jordanian and Israeli territories along the Dead Sea, 
they found more materials uh, usually after the Bedouin had found them that knew the area so intimately. Fragments of literary works have been identified at all of these sites along the Dead Sea. Noteworthy is the overlap between some of the finds at Masada and Qumran. For the most part, I must confine this presentation to the material from Qumran. In the end, we have 11 scrolls from Qumran and the literary compositions that have re been reconstructed from the thousands of fragments. At present, we estimate that about 975 manuscripts or copies have been identified in the Qumran corpus. Approximately one quarter of these copies are texts uh, of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Another 50 are from the Apocrypha, also called Deuterocanonical, in the Roman Catholic tradition, books such as Tobit, and from the Pseudepigrapha, copies of works such as Enoch and Jubilees, considered canonical in the tradition of the Ethiopian Church, but not in the Western European Church traditions. Fragments of the astronomical Enoch and of the Aramaic Levi will be found in the museum display. The remainder, approximately 720 manuscripts, are of works that were unknown to the modern world prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. About three quarters of these texts are in Hebrew, one quarter in Aramaic, with occasionally a few Greek manuscripts. All told, 246 manuscripts of some portion of the Hebrew Bible have been found in the various locations along the Dead Sea. After the Book of Psalms, Deuteronomy, and Isaiah are the most popular representations. Remember that there was no Bible in antiquity in which all the writings were assembled into one volume. All we have are scrolls of individual books, very occasionally two or three books on a scroll. We note that fragments continue to be purchased on the market. These are all presently in the process of publication. Azusa Pacific University and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary have both purchased fragments of biblical books. A private collector in Norway has purchased a total of 115 fragments from 26 different literary compositions. We turn briefly to the biblical manuscripts. Prior to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were three families of texts that were evident to scholars when they looked at manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, the Masoretic text, which is used in the traditional texts of the Jewish community, the Samaritan Bible, that included only the Pentateuch, and the Septuagint, the Greek translation, that gives evidence of older Hebrew texts from which its manuscripts were translated. Biblical scholars debated which text represented the older and hence the more authentic biblical texts. In the museum exhibit, you will see a fragment of 4Q Samuel A that reflects more readings that agree with the texts of the Septuagint, the Greek translation, than the Masoretic text. The oldest text of Samuel in the collection is from around 250 BCE. This copy was written between, this copy on display was written between 50 and 25 BCE. As you know, the books of Chronicles are based upon Samuel and Kings. So we find in 4Q Samuel A some readings that also appear in Chronicles, previous unattested in any of our biblical versions. This text also points to an incident that was probably omitted from our copies of the Hebrew Bible, where at the end of 1 Samuel 10, the scribe skipped a phrase between the Hebrew verbs that looked similar. This incident has been added in the New Revised Standard versions of our Bible at the end of chapter 10. Note that here it does not have any of the traditional verse numbers we associate with the biblical text. 
Also included in the museum exhibit will be a fragment from 4Q Numbers B, which has readings closer to the Samaritan text. The Samaritan connection to some of these texts is becoming more evident in recent research, with interesting possibilities for the rather obscure history of the relationship of this group to other Israelite and Jewish traditions. Fragments from 1Q Daniel A will also be displayed. The case of Daniel is fascinating because eight copies of the book, a rather substantial number, were found there. The oldest copy comes from around 125 BCE. This is only 40 years after the date we assume for the final composition of the book in 165 to 164 BCE. This is a remarkable process of development for a biblical book. Other texts related to Daniel, but not previously known, such as the prayer of Nabonidus, are also present. You may also know that the book of Daniel, as found in the Hebrew Bible, is composed partly in Aramaic and partly in Hebrew. The transition to Aramaic in the text and then back to Hebrew is the same in the Qumran text as in our other versions of the Hebrew Bible that come from the later time period. For preservation purposes, the Israel Antiquities Authority will change the fragments on display halfway through the six-month run. In both displays, you will see portions of the Psalm scroll. This is an important scroll because it tells us something different about our biblical texts. Here we see a different order for the Psalms, as well as the inclusion of Psalms previously known only from other texts, such as the Syriac version of the Bible, as well as some Psalms not known to us at all beforehand. In general, the version of the Psalms appear to follow our versions of the Bible through Psalm 89, then start to diverge with the next section of that biblical book. So far for a romp through the biblical texts. Now for this vast collection of 720 manuscripts of non-biblical texts. The transformation of our understanding of significant developments in Jewish history and of Christian origins in the past half century are rooted largely in these texts. I will say something about the legal texts, biblical interpretation, and wisdom texts. Similar contributions are being made to the study of liturgy, prayer, messianism, and eschatology on the basis of these important texts. There seems to be two types of legal texts that are related but somewhat different. The direct connection with the biblical law codes is more apparent with the first type, the works of the law, one of which is the temple scroll. This is the longest intact scroll that has emerged from the Qumran finds, about 28 feet long, probably about 30 feet originally. Only the first column is entirely missing. It is one of the most audacious documents known from Israelite and Jewish history in that it is written entirely in the first person, and God is the speaker. In this scroll, God is talking directly to Moses and by implication to all of Israel. There is no book in the Bible which constitutes a continuous address from God. Ascribing such speech directly to God on a sustained basis demonstrates a level of chutzpah previously unknown in Jewish texts. This is the manner in, in which the composition justifies and mandates new law. For example, remember that biblical law has no injunctions against polygamy. In this case, by changing the meaning of the text in Leviticus 18.18 at the bottom of the slide, which prohibits a man from also marrying the sister of his wife in a polygamous relationship, the temple scroll extends that biblical law to include an injunction against polygamy and possibly divorce. 
What's the justification? Well, God says so. Another document in this category is something called 4QMMT, Some of the Works of Torah. It is a list of prescriptions of a ritual and personal nature in which the composition argues that we have determined the following things. In this legislation, historians get excited when they read that a liquid stream does not protect a pure vessel from an impure one. In other words, if I pour a liquid from a pitcher into an impure container, the pitcher becomes impure because the liquid makes the connection between the container and the pitcher. Scholars of ancient Jewish history know that in the Mishnah, the composition upon which the Talmud is based, this was recorded as its dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. A question of Jewish law recorded in the Mishnah, a document from 200 CE, now has been demonstrated to have been an issue at least 350 years earlier. And the viewpoint is attributed to the Sadducees a group that Josephus, the Jewish historian, associates with the high priest. Fascinating developments. When we turn to the rules texts, the other kind of legislation in these scrolls, we are looking at individual and group rules for a community or a body of persons who share a common viewpoint and lifestyle, commonly considered to be sectarian. The Damascus document is one of the most important rules. Copies of it were known from the Cairo Geniza found in 1896 to 97. It was quickly related to the Dead Sea Scrolls because fragments of ten copies of it were found at Qumran. A fragment of one copy of this text will be on display. In this composition, people are called to come out to form a new covenant in the land of Damascus. In this case, we see the legislation of the Temple Scroll carried even a little further, or at least made more definite, on the basis of the same biblical text, Leviticus 18.18. 18. Here they commit fornication, violate the laws of conduct by taking two wives in their lifetime. Scholars debate whether this may even prohibit remarriage after divorce, similar to some interpretations of Matthew 32, 5.32 and 19.9. On the next folio of this text, we find an injunction against the marriage of the uncle and niece, while biblical legislation only prohibits the marriage of the aunt and the nephew. This seems to be based on an argument for gender equality. Who would have thought? The history of such legislation noted in these different texts from the Qumran corpus is significant for the study of Christian origins and for the development of Jewish halakha. The community rule outlines legislation for a group. The Hebrew word yachad, most commonly translated as community, is the central term for this composition. It outlines prescriptions for a communitarian way of life similar in some ways to the description of the Essenes in Josephus. Thirteen copies of this composition are found in the Qumran corpus, and a fragment of one of these copies will also be on display. The dualistic nature of this document is readily apparent. Looking at the text, you reread, he created humankind to rule over the world appointing them for them two spirits in which to walk until the time ordained for its visitation. These are the spirits of truth and falsehood. Upright character and fate originate with the habitation of light, perverse with the fountain of darkness. The authority of the Prince of Light extends to the governance of all righteous people, therefore they walk in the paths of light. Correspondingly, the authority of the angel of darkness embraces the governance of all wicked people, so they walk in the paths of darkness. This section, entitled The Treatise on the Two Spirits, 
follows an induction and covenant renewal ceremony in which the participants bless the sons of light and curse the sons of darkness. When we take a look at their biblical commentaries, interpretation, we note that they are called pesharim, one of the terms used for dream interpretation in the Hebrew Bible. The most well-known, since it comes from the original finds in Cave 1, is Pesher Habakkuk. Here we see how in a verse-by-verse -verse commentary format, the book of Habakkuk is interpreted as applying to the life of the sect. In this case, the word traitors in Habakkuk is interpreted as, designated the, as designating the opponents of the sect. In a slightly more complicated column, the author tells readers that God told Habakkuk what was going to happen in the future, but God didn't tell Habakkuk when. That has now been made known through the teacher of righteousness. So just like the injunctions for watchfulness and patience with regard to future events found in the New Testament, so we find them here a century or more earlier. A fragment of the Pesher on Isaiah will be on display at the museum. We earlier discussed the Temple Scroll, an example of what we call rewritten Bible or scriptures. In this form of commentary, we cannot distinguish the biblical text from possible additions solely on the basis of the manner in which the text is constructed. It is, as, it is as though the entire document was written as though it were a biblical text. The Book of Jubilees, like Temple Scroll, is also an example of this genre. This technique is also found among prophetic books. On display, you'll find a fragment of a text called Pseudo-Ezekiel another example of this genre of biblical interpretation. We will not discuss examples of all of the remaining genres in this list of genres. However, I will close with some examples of the wisdom texts. The best known is called instruction. We have evidence of eight or more copies of this, a significant number in the Qumran corpus. The longest copy originally would have been close to 30 feet long, and we have about 300 fragments of it. We spec expect it was composed around 200 BCE or even earlier. One fragment of this text will be on display. In this fragmentary text, the remains of its first column, we see that a role for a heavenly host is included in these descriptions as the sons of truth face the consequences of righteous judgment. There also is hope that an epoch of truth will be realized. This is material similar to what we might find in an apocalyptic composition such as Enoch. However, much of this composition is fashioned as wisdom literature similar to what we might read in Proverbs and Sirach. It is the advice characteristic of the book of Proverbs combined with apocalyptic expectations. This makes for a really interesting combination in the third and second centuries BCE unknown to us prior to the discovery of this literature. In this column, we see a lot of advice about how to behave when you are poor and warnings concerning the consequences of debt. Advice for marriage is also found in one section of instruction. Another addresses the female members of the intended audience. Others address craftsmen and farmers. This is a remarkable composition with multiple copies that has caused scholars to begin a re-examination of the distinction between apocalyptic and wisdom literature, traditionally considered by most scholars to be unrelated to one another. We close with a look at that text found at Qumran, which is most similar to the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. While the beginning is not 
clear, it appears to include eight Beatitudes, just like the Sermon on the Mount, followed by a more lengthy conclusion. Of course, this text centers in an exclusive attention to the law. Look at the middle section. Blessed is the man who has obtained wisdom. He walks in the law of the Most High and prepares his heart for her ways. He conducts himself according to her discipline, and in her corrections he delights daily. He does not leave her unheeded during the afflictions of, dis of his distress. In the time of hardship he does not abandon her. He does not forget her in the days of dread, and, the infliction, and in the affliction of his soul he does not abhor her. Of course, the the Matthean text centers on Jesus. Persecution and hardship character, characterize the lives of the followers in both instances, and both point to a later reward. Noteworthy is the fact that this same wisdom text in column 15 begins with a scene of judgment that could come straight out of an Indiana Jones movie. What is significant about these wisdom texts is that they do not reflect hints of the sectarian existence advocated in the various versions of the Damascus document and the community rule. They appear to have been composed earlier than these sectarian compositions, and they say they suggest a literature that may not have been composed at that site or even in relationship to that group but it points to aspects of Jewish life in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE that were unknown to us prior to their discovery. The same thing could be said about the fragments of Enoch and some other writings as well. This evidence begins to fill in our understanding of Jewish life three centuries prior to the origins of Christianity, and four centuries prior to the final collection of the material in the Mishnah, the oldest literary composition of Rabbinic Judaism. So we are left with the puzzle of Dead Sea Scroll studies. Each of these three bodies of evidence raise questions about their interpretation. How then do we make sense of the interconnection between them? We are now probing issues that we wouldn't even have dreamed of 30 years ago. We emerge with a new view of the Judaism in those last two centuries before Christianity and Rabbinic Judaism appeared on the scene, a viewpoint remarkably different than the one held even by the first generation of scroll scholars. However, that new viewpoint is only in its infancy as we begin to unpack the revelations embedded within these remarkable 